Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on the changes in Turkey's foreign policy. I'm Anise Basile Tabrizi, and I'm a senior research fellow at the International Security Studies Department at RUSI, where I lead the Unpacking the MENA program. Today's webinar is part of an ongoing series of activities we are producing as part of the program. Next week, for instance, we'll have a discussion on Iran and the global community, which we organize together with the Doha Forum. To know more about the program and to be up to date on all our events and publication, do follow us on Twitter at ISS underscore Rusi and sign up to our newsletter. You can find all the information about the program and the link to our newsletter at rusi.org slash projects slash unpacking hyphen Mina. Now, I'm very pleased to hand over the floor to our wonderful senior associate fellow, Dr. Zia Meral, who will chair our discussion on Turkey with a stellar lineup of speakers. Thanks again for tuning in today and enjoy the discussion. Zia, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Anise, and, and thanks to everybody who joined us today. This is a really fascinating conversation, um, people joining in to speak from Washington, DC, Ireland, and, and Turkey. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to unpack a lot of questions that you have, but there's often a fatigue, a strategic fatigue, as I call it, when it comes to discussions on Turkey and London and Brussels and Washington, DC. We have seen a pattern of behavior in, in communications and foreign policy decisions from Ankara that kind of gives us cynicism whenever we see any sign of reform or a positive signal coming from Ankara. Erdogan goes into escalation with a foreign power, and then there's a normalization cooling off period, and then comes back with positive messages towards EU, towards NATO, towards the United States. But with Biden victory, some things seem to have changed in Ankara, at least in messaging, not just towards the European Union, towards the United States, but even to Saudi Arabia, even to some of the issues in its neighborhood that Ankara seems to be occasionally for the last couple of months signaling a desire to ease some of the tensions and pass some domestic reforms in economy, even in judiciary, as last week we have seen new announcements. Do they add to anything? Is this something new? Are we seeing the same cycle? Is, is Turkey is it possible at this stage for Turkey Altis foreign policy course? Um, there's a lot of questions to ask, and I'm thrilled to have three colleagues on this call who are wiser than me in all of these questions to hear their insights. Um, we'll start with them in their preliminary remarks for a few minutes on their areas of work and analysis, and then we'll come to you in the question and answer time um, to see what you want to discuss and what you want to ask. And I can look at some of your names. Some of you have observed Turkey, worked in Turkey, or work on Turkey for a long time. So it will be good to bring you into the discussion through your questions or statements in the q a as well we'll first start with omar and he's based in washington dc um, and his views on u.s turkish relations and how it shapes turkish foreign policy what are the current challenges what are the current possibilities with biden victory and then we'll go to Asli um, right after omar to discuss what turkey and europe relationship might look like is there a way of saving it salvaging it containing it or are we doomed to see the deterioration in relations and mistrust and the dead end EU accession framework as the only hope we have to maintain. And then we'll come to Hannah with some of the um, key portfolios that Turkey is bogged down at the moment in East Med, in Middle East, but even some of the domestic attitudes as she's based in Turkey and see whether change is possible or are we basically set to see a Turkey trying to walk an impossible um, title walk. Um, let's start with you. Obviously, the Biden victory has changed certain things in Turkey's perception of what it can get away with, what it can achieve in that relationship, but in the region. Is this towards positive? Is it negative? Or is Biden focus going to be containing or ignoring Turkey even? Me unmute me. Thank you, Zia. Uh, thank you for the invitation and a hello to everybody. Uh, you started by saying that there is a strategic fatigue uh, about Turkey. And uh, whenever you put the term strategic in front of something, it sounds much more uh, impressive. I, I would say there is simply fatigue uh, about Turkey, uh, on Turkey in, in Washington. Uh, primarily because the problems appear to be deeply structural at this point. Uh, everyone knows, I, I'm sure most of the participants are familiar with the list, long list of problems in Turkish-American relations, and they uh, got worse in the last couple of years, uh, primarily because it's becoming more difficult to compartmentalize uh, these problems. Uh, there was a time under the Trump administration, thanks to the 
uh, special partnership, special relationship between, I would say, Trump and Erdogan, there was a sense that things could be compartmentalized. But today, with a new administration uh, uh, and a Congress that is increasingly uh, showing less patience with Turkey, I would say, uh, recently there has been more than 150 congressmen uh, writing letters to the administration uh, highlighting human rights abuses. Uh, 54 senators wrote letters to the administration. So, so Congress remains uh, uh, quite disappointed with things with Turkey. The administration, I think, is right now in crisis management and damage control mode uh, as far as uh, domestic dynamics are concerned. Uh, let's not forget the US domestic context here. There, there, there is a reason why Biden has not even called Erdogan yet. Uh, he has an extremely uh, heavy domestic agenda. And this administration, when it tries to formulate foreign policy, it now has shown that it has always one eye in domestic dynamics. In many ways, they have learned the lessons of the Trump years by saying that they have to pay attention to the American middle class. Everything seems to be targeting now uh, uh, United States, that they don't want to use the term America first, but they're deeply aware that uh, uh, they need to uh, pay attention to domestic dynamics, to the average American. And uh, in terms of foreign policy, uh, they are in need of prioritization. And one region that they're not willing to really prioritize is the Middle East. Uh, so they really want to uh, in the tradition that started about 10 years ago with uh, the Obama administration, they want to prioritize the Asia Pacific region. They also want to prioritize the Western Hemisphere. They want to prioritize allies, uh, the European Union, NATO. And on this list, uh, Turkey appears to be one country where, to use a term that uh, has been now uh, uh, used for in the framework of Saudi Arabia, they don't want rupture with Turkey, just like they don't want rupture with Saudi Arabia, uh, but they probably want a recalibration. Uh, again, a term that they are using for Mohammed bin Salman, a recalibration of relations with, with Turkey. What would that entail? Uh, I, would, I would say it would tend to entail some level of uh, uh, distance from Turkey, not paying too much attention to what Turkey is doing, not paying too much attention to Erdogan, unless there are really uh, positive steps coming from, from Ankara. And to try to maintain uh, a, uh, a uh, working relationship, uh, when you look at the list of people that will be dealing with Turkey, uh, I mean, I, I have basically uh, the, 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 the three important ones uh, and the president, uh, Lloyd Austin, the uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, comes from CENTCOM. Uh, he has very jaded views about Turkey's role in Syria. Uh, it's not good for Turkey that a CENTCOM, a former CENTCOM commander, is heading uh, the uh, Pentagon. Uh, there is still a CENTCOM, UCOM, uh, NATO uh, divide uh, within the Pentagon when it comes to Turkey. Uh, the NATO hands, the UCOM hands, tend to see Turkey's institutional ties with the transatlantic alliance uh, important. They don't want to, quote unquote, lose Turkey. Whereas in the eyes of CENTCOM, uh, Turkey's uh, Syria policy, it's help for uh, Islamist groups, it's targeting of the uh, YPG, PYD, the Kurdish group, has left uh, deep damages in the way CENTCOM uh, looks at Turkey. And Lloyd Austin, in many ways, is not someone who is very optimistic, in my opinion, about uh, what Turkey can do uh, for the United States in the region. It, he doesn't see Turkey as a calling called strong strategic staunch ally. Uh, Jake Sullivan uh, is the one who is the most positive uh, in relations, in my opinion. He is a positive human being by nature. He, he wants to improve things. Uh, he believes that you know, there can be some level of compartmentalization. He has been in touch with his counterpart, Ibrahim Kalan. Uh, so they will try to compartmentalize, but he's also deeply aware that the context has changed, especially on the S-400 issue. Uh, Congress has passed the National Defense Authorization Act, which makes things more, more difficult in terms of compartmentalization. And that ties to a certain degree the National Security Advisor's hands in terms of 
you know, how to coordinate Turkey policy, because as long as the S-400s will remain on Turkey's soil, the sanctions will, be, will remain. And if Turkey uh, decides to improve its partnership with, uh, with, with Russia by buying Russian fifth generation uh, uh, weapons, uh, jets, for instance, uh, instead of you know, uh, NATO compatible uh, equipment, I think the sanctions will worsen. And even someone like Jake Sullivan, who I think deep down believes that this relationship is salvageable, that there can be compartmentalization, he will have a difficult time. Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, uh, had a conversation with his counterpart, Mevlüt Cavusoglu. Tony Blinken is also the ultimate diplomat. Uh, he is in favor of uh, compartmentalization, in my opinion. Uh, but again, the same analysis applies to, to him that I made for Jake Sullivan. Uh, it's difficult to, to move things forward when you have an uh, item like the S-400 on the agenda. And uh, finally, the most experienced uh, foreign policy uh, president uh, in the last uh, couple of decades will be Joe Biden himself. I mean, he's very experienced. He knows Erdogan, he knows Turkey personally. And uh, people who know Joe Biden know that he, uh, at the end of the day, makes these decisions based on his, uh, his own uh, analysis. So he, he surrounds himself with advisors but he already has tremendous experience on Turkey. And I think of all the people that I cited here, he may be in fact the one who is the most jaded on Turkey. Uh, he he uh, knows Erdogan quite well. He was on record with the New York Times for calling him an autocrat. Uh, I don't think he regrets that. Uh, I think he, he, he wants to set a new tone in relations with Turkey. Uh, on the other hand, he may have been surprised by the pushback he got from the Turkish opposition itself that didn't want to be associated with working with Biden or the United States. So that may have even lessened his enthusiasm about uh, the future of Turkey. If the opposition is like that, if, if there is uh, such reluctance coming from even the, uh, uh, the uh, anti-Erdogan camp, that shows that even post-Erdogan Turkey may not be that much of a different place. And that's something that I keep hearing a lot these days. There was a time in Washington where everyone was optimistic about, uh, you know, uh, Turkey being bigger than Erdogan, let's invest in post-Erdogan Turkey. But overall, when you see the reaction that the opposition is giving on issues like the S-400 or its policies on the Kurdish question, uh, I mean, it remains to be seen, of course, I don't want to be too pessimistic, but there is a school of thought which says, uh, do not have very high expectations that Turkey will radically change uh, after Erdogan. So let me conclude by saying that the urgent always trumps the important in Washington. And the urgent issue right now, as I said, uh, is the S-400. But uh, uh, this summer, uh, another urgent issue will hit the agenda. Uh, and that will be the uh, Halkbank uh, case which will definitely uh, make things even more difficult for the partnership because my sense is that uh, Turkey missed an opportunity to deal with the Halkbank before it goes to court. Now that it is uh, uh, at court, uh, the hands of uh, any US politician is tied. Uh, even if Trump was the president, uh, he, would not, he would not have an opportunity to really change dynamics on Halkbank. And if a, a, a penalty to the tune of you know, five, ten billion dollars comes to this bank, this will really hurt the partnership. I think Erdogan will have no option than reacting in a conspiratorial way, saying that they're staging a coup against him. And so I'm not particularly optimistic about how uh, relations can be compartmentalized or recalibrated when you have uh, items like S-400 uh, and, and Hulk Bank hitting. And deep down, one final word uh, before I conclude, I think the structural problem in Turkish-American relationship is that uh, since the post-Cold War uh, era began, the two countries have not really uh, adapted well to the new environment uh, that they're in. The expectations are irrational. Um, uh, I think Aslı and Jeremy Shapiro wrote a very good piece about uh, expectation management uh, uh, in terms of uh, the new paradigm in this relationship. Uh, not only the United States keeps thinking that there, there is this old Turkey that, that can be a staunch ally, there is this romanticization of a uh, 
a golden age that never existed in Turkish-American relations. But also uh, Turkey is stuck in this view that you know, the United States is always uh, trying to create mischief in the region or is helping the wrong, uh, the wrong countries or exaggerates the importance of the United States in world politics. But there's also an additional problem and that's the threat perception. I think for a long time since 9-11, Turkey's threat perception and America's threat perception has been diverging. Turkey in the post-Cold War era is fixated on the PKK, on the Kurdish problem. The United States has been fixated on, on ideological terrorism, jihadist, Al-Qaeda, ISIS. And until Syria exploded, the two countries managed to uh, 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 agree to disagree on their threat perceptions. In Syria, that has become impossible. In Syria, the United States partnered up with what Turkey uh, rightly considers a, a, a PKK-like uh, uh, entity, uh, a, the Syrian wing of the PKK. That's no longer a, a difference of threat perception. That's actively in the eyes of Turkey, its partners helping its uh, existential threat. And the, in the eyes of the United States, Turkey decided to partner up with uh, Syrian Islamist, yeah. very often jihadist groups. So. Uh, for the United States, that's the existential, existential threat. So when you have two countries, not only differing on their threat perceptions, but actively engaged in helping each other's existential threat, good luck solving that problem. <laughs> yeah, um, Omar, thank you so much. I mean, I find it very interesting that you started your analysis looking at um, key individuals appointed in Biden administration, their backgrounds and their outlook, um, which is a huge turn away from how we analyze things during the Trump administration, right, which was more bilateral personal relationship and other conversations unfolding, even the son-in-laws in the picture. Now mm -hmm. we're kind of back to more um, institutional understanding of US foreign policy and how that actually seeks to compartmentalize and engage with Turkey, which has its own positives and negatives as well too. The other huge chunk of external stimuli that shapes things in Turkey and direction of Turkey is obviously Europe. If there's strategic fatigue in, 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 in US, then you could talk about a strategic myopia or blindness beyond fatigue when it comes to Europe. But it's been interesting that even President Macron and, and Erdogan had tried to have a couple of phone conversations and trying to find a way to send some positive messaging to ease some tensions. But again, just like the US, there are some structural issues. There are huge strategic divergences, divergences in this picture. Um, and we have Asli to really ask that question. Asli, is it actually possible to imagine a dynamic now where Turkey can change its relationship with Europe, find another framework to integrate economically, um, align politically and diplomatically, or are we set to see a bilateral containment and, and compartmentalization with occasional positive messages sent about Turkey's future being in Europe? Well, uh, it, it's difficult to speak after Omar because he's given uh, uh, such a comprehensive account of uh, where how Turkey is seen, uh, particularly in Washington, and quite a depressing one. But I want to start out by saying that let us not forget that part of the reason we're in such a depressing uh, situation right now is is the fact that there has been a good deal of damage in Turkey's relations with the West and uh, certainly domestic traje trajectory over the four past four years uh, under Trump administration, uh, mitigating uh, basically uh, Turkey's uh, multilateral relations with the United States and European partners to a personal phone relationship between these two men and often uh, very opaque uh, and transactional uh, set of arrangements. Um, we are where we are now. Uh, there is uh, also a discrepancy in, uh, of course, in uh, how Turkey has been um, positioning itself for domestic audiences as sort of making Turkey great again, as, as, as a country pursuing its own destiny, rebuilding the empire, et cetera, with military footprint outside of its borders. And actually, uh, the real uh, strategic isolation that it's facing, both in its own region and when it comes to uh, uh, dealings with its uh, Western uh, partner partners. Tony Blinken has famously called Turkey our so-called ally in a recent appearance uh, at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And I think a certain amount of that is definitely um, 
uh, is definitely felt in Europe. Before I get to uh, uh, how Europeans feel, I just want to sort of uh, go say something on the Turkish-U.S. relationship because the, the atmosphere that Omar has described what is called the cold shouldering by the new Biden administration, the fact that there's not been a phone call, the fact that we're, we've had a, a, a number of uh, critical um, uh, you know, statements from the US administration on Turkey's human rights record, et cetera. It is starting to sink in now and only now. Uh, up until this point, I think there was an expectation in Ankara that the ultimately, as every US administration had done, the Biden people will want to have a ground bargain, a big table where we can talk about everything. As for hundreds, we give you that, you give us this, but clearly there's no appetite for that. Uh, and, and it's not just a matter of cold shoulder, giving Turkey a cold shoulder, Biden not calling Erdogan, as Omar has pointed out, there is the actual danger that, United States is pivoting away from Turkey as a key regional partner in its effort to pivot uh, pivot away from uh, the Middle East entirely. So these are just starting to sink in. And perhaps related to that, we are also seeing a, a charm offensive towards Europe. When I say charm offensive, of course, uh, it's not really charming. <laughs> it's not really all that charming, but because the relations have been so bad over the past couple of years, and in particular in 2019 and 2020, with both Libya and East Med and, and, and sort of a, a stream of spats between Turkey and Germany, and later on between Turkey and France, uh, I think uh, you know the little that is happening now. Uh, it, it, I, both sides are taking it seriously, uh, so uh, there is a desire in Europe to establish a constructive relationship with Turkey. Whether we could, it's not what it was. It's not certainly, uh, you know, uh, the reality is is not uh, trying to create a, an inclusive space for Turkey inside uh, Europe. But it is the it is based on the notion that Turkey is a resurgent power at Europe's doorstep, an important neighbor. Therefore, we need a stable relationship with Turkey. This is this view is very much shaped by German sentiments and uh, but Germany is not alone in uh, desiring a, a sort of a modus vivendi with Turkey. There are other member states from Italy to Spain to several others who actually uh, do not see eye to eye with France. Um, who has come to see a, a resurgent Turkey in Eastern Mediterranean and elsewhere, uh, including in Libya in, in, and in the South, South Caucasus as as a threat, but uh, the two, but it seems like the two camps uh, within Europe have now uh, decided to give it a go. There's uh, so successive EU Council Council meetings have not produced the sort of much feared sanctions uh, against Turkey, and if it were, and I don't expect uh, uh, any of that uh, in the March uh, EU Council meetings. Uh, in, in an interesting way, um, as the Americans are coming on to the, the Biden administration arrives at the scene with an agenda also to promote democracy globally, but also in Turkey to make it a, a, a bilateral issue, uh, an, an agenda item in bilateral relations, Europeans are moving in the opposite direction in the sense that there is a, an effort to sort of focus on a positive agenda, uh, things like the, the, the resumption of direct Turkish Greek talks, you know, the fact that Turkey has pulled back its exploratory vessels around Cyprus, perhaps, you know, the Secretary General is going to do a, a round of exploratory talks in, in, in um, uh, the, the UN Secretary General in Geneva later next month, but a, a, de a clear a uh, decision to de-emphasize, I would say, human rights in the bilateral relations. As you know, it's been the reverse over the past couple of years with Europe uh, uh, focusing more on uh, Turkey's domestic trajectory, but we're going to see a role reversal now that is uh, clear. Um, uh, I, one of the uh, other issues that I think is important is S-400 is going to be very important for uh, for Americans, that is clear. Uh, there is a, you know, it's not it's not clear whether there's a deal on the table or not. The Turkish uh, defense minister Hulusi Akar has has offered a Crete formula, uh, which is to say keeping it in a box. But then, uh, you know, President Erdogan's spokesman seemed to have walked walked back from that. 
But I think that in some way, the kind of cold shouldering that has been going on coming from Washington, the sort of uh, the, the uh, intentional neglect from the Biden administration is creating a situation in which uh, US leverage has increased. So it has US leverage has increased and is, is creating a situation in which, uh, you know, various con concessions and or new formulas on issues like S400s, I think are more likely if there is a discipline on the on the US side in terms of keeping up this sort of intentional intentional uh, social distancing policy. Um, it's also uh, positively impacting uh, Turkey's relations with Europe. As you, you've mentioned, Zia, President Erdogan's call to Macron, he's already, I believe, written a letter. Uh, there is a desire to fix relations with uh, other European powers, not so much not so much that Turkey wants to take the steps that are uh, that would be hugely important in its uh, rule of law uh, architecture, including uh, you know uh, having a positive movement on uh, cases like Osman Kavala. But I think uh, positive in the sense that you know there is a desire for uh, to find a, a working formula that works for all sides in Eastern Mediterranean. Turkey's way of negotiating these issues is, is, is unique. It's always upping the ante and driving a hard bargain, but it does seem like Europeans have understood Erdogan's style and are uh, also willing to work with that. Um, I think that um, to the extent that we can look for positive items, Cyprus will be important. Even though the two positions seem too far right now, I think that I have, uh, uh, I'm not entirely hopeless. Uh, Turkey is calling for a two state solution. The Greek side is still, uh, Cypriots are still interested in bizonal, bicommunal federation. But there's more and more uh, interest in Europe in thinking creatively about Cyprus. In, in, in finding maybe new formulas, new frameworks that are more likely to succeed than the um, BBF, uh, BBF being uh, bizonal bicommunal federation that's been the guiding principle uh, to no avail over the past four years. Uh, there's been also, on a, as a final note, a small adjustment, I think, uh, in my view, also in expectation and anticipation of the Biden administration in Turkey's policies towards uh, regional partners that had been uh, seen as uh, its uh, rivals and if not foes. That is to say, we we're seeing some sort of a thaw in relations with Saudi Arabia, certainly an adjustment towards Egypt and Israel. Uh, and uh, and uh, very surprisingly, um, a desire, a stated desire uh, for normalization of relations with Armenia, not a huge strategic issue, and it, this is not flat. Uh, this this idea is not floated, it, it, not thrown in uh, for uh, historic reconciliation purposes. It's primarily driven by uh, an economic desire to expand Turkey's uh, commercial uh, footprint in the Central Asia. But nonetheless, it could be one of the uh, peripheral issues over the next couple of years that uh, that do create a positive agenda. Yeah, and, uh, uh, maybe uh, let me end here, Zia. Uh, thank you so much, Asla. I mean, it's really fascinating that actually, even though we're discussing Europe, we can't do that without discussing US. We can't do that without discussing East Med and Middle East. And it goes to show how untangled these things are and how when people call for strategic decoupling or even strategic ignoring of a conversation you actually cannot because the prisoners of geography as Tim Marshall has named there is a reality that makes all of these impossible to completely walk away from and Hannah will come to you obviously you observed a lot of the developments in East Med in the Middle East in Syria and etc and you're based in Turkey as well too but it seems like even though at bilateral conversation level with European states and US, Turkey could find some sort of um, way of compartmentalizing particular agendas with economy and trade, taking priority counterterrorism and security, narcotics, organized crime, whatnot. But there are a lot of portfolios it's bogged in. I mean, I still already hinted on the question of Cyprus and the East Med. There's still the question of Syria, right? I mean, Turkish presence there went from 
wanting to change certain things, push Assad for reform to actually toppling him, then giving up on that whole agenda, focusing on PKK white related groups. And now what now? So it looks like a lot of Turkish foreign policies actually broke down in issues that are not that easy to walk away from. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're coming up to the 10th anniversary of the Syrian revolution, right? That's going to be on March the 15th. So, um, yeah, I've actually spent the past couple of weeks talking to a lot of people in Syria and in Turkey about, you know, what's changed. And, you know, it, it's so um, interesting to look back and remember, like, 10 years ago, not only was Turkey on the same side as the US when it came to Syria, but also Turkey was being talked about as, you know, the country that might be the inspiration um, for kind of, you know, newly emerging Arab democracies and also might be taking a kind of leadership role in, in the kind of new Middle East. And certainly I think, you know, that is what Erdogan was envisaging for himself. Um, I think that's, you know, a big part of the reason why he threw his weight behind certain factions um, you know, in not only Syria, but also in Egypt, in Libya, in Tunisia. Um, now, of course, that's not how everything turned out. And, you know, we're in a really different position today. But, you know, as well as, you know, you say that all these different kind of issues are really difficult to um, compartmentalize because they're all sort of bound in together. Not only that, you know, in Turkey, it's really, really difficult to separate foreign policy from domestic policy. You know, Erdogan, especially over the past five years, has again and again used foreign policy for domestic ends. And he's able to do that because there are certain issues which are cross-party in Turkey, or let's say cross-social rather. Um, you know, these are issues on which pretty much across the board, most, if not all Turks agree on. One of them is the Kurds and, uh, or let's say the Kurdish militias. Um, and, you know, the feeling that the US has been incredibly disingenuous when it comes to their policy in Syria and vis-a-vis -vis the Kurds. Um, another one is disillusionment with the EU, um, you know, almost across the board, Turks feel that, you know, the EU has never been particularly straight up with them, particularly countries like France, um, you know, that they feel that there's always been resistance within the EU to having a major Muslim country joining the bloc, and they feel like they've been messed around, uh, that Brussels hasn't been particularly honest with them, and of course, you know, with Britain leaving the EU, the Turkey's lost probably its you know biggest and staunchest ally in the bloc. And then there's the East Med slash Cyprus issue, which you know is something that's bubbled up um, over the past, let's say three or four years, but particularly since last summer. Um, but it's really to do with two really, really long running issues, which is about you know, maritime borders in the Aegean um, and also about a Cypriot settlement which still hasn't been found after 40 years. So these are things that Erdogan whenever he's been kind of facing domestic problems at home has been able to really effectively um, use in order to a distract people's attentions from maybe economic problems or human rights issues in Turkey and get everyone to rally around behind the flag. Um, so we saw that in the East Med. Um, we saw it again you know, three weeks ago when it came to the Gara operation in northern Iraq. Um, you know, 13 Turkish hostages killed, uh, three more Turkish troops killed during that operation. Um, and the really interesting thing there actually is that for the first time uh, when it comes to an anti-PKK operation, it, partly because it didn't work out as planned, but also because of Erdogan's handling of it, there was criticism from the opposition towards the Turkish policy there. Um, you know, I, I think you know, the, some of the things that Erdogan did in the wake of, um, you know, the, those lives being lost in northern Iraq, you know, standing up in a rally in, in the Black Sea and trying to call the mother of one of, one of the killed soldiers, um, you know, as Kilsterolu pointed out, you know, laughing and joking at that rally, you know, it, it points to a leader who's really, really lost touch with the mood of his people. Um, you know, it, my reading of this is that, you know, in the typical way of leaders who are becoming more and more autocratic, his circle is shrunk around him. At this point, I think there are no dissenting voices around him, speaking truth to power. Um, and he's really sort of lost touch with the mood of his country. So I, I think at this point, you know, this thing that he's always relied on 
over the past half decade of, of using foreign policy in order to bump up his domestic support really at this point is diminishing returns. Um, and I think, you know, this is probably one of the major reasons why at this point he's now kind of done an about face. You know, he's trying to uh, you know, reverse tack with, with Europe, with the US. I think, you know, even he probably also realizes at this point that there's been a paradigm shift um, in the US that there isn't going to be this kind of secure for, you know, bad behavior either from him or from Orban or from Putin that there had been under the Trump era. Um, so yeah, so I think um, these are the things that are driving his policy reversal. Um, however, you know, it, a bit of realism, he's still stuck between, you know, reforms and the MHP. He, he can't control the parliament without the nationalists and they're not going to um, really kind of tolerate any real kind of policy change when it comes to uh, certainly the PKK and the Kurds. Um, but also, you know, I think when he talks about things like judicial reforms and, you know, a new human rights policy, I mean, that was met with cynicism bordering on mirth in Turkey. I mean, you know, you, how can you talk about judicial reforms when you still have Osman Kavala and Salahattin Demirtas in prison? How can you talk about human rights reforms when you have the police rounding up dozens of Boazaji students in dawn raids and, and allegedly strip searching some of those female students? You know, how can you talk about human rights when almost all of the HDP mayors who were democratically elected in uh, March 2019 have been removed from their posts? So, yeah, I, I think he's really stuck in a bit of a bind at the moment. Um, you know, certainly when it comes to domestic reforms, I, I can't see them going, you know, anywhere particularly concrete. Um, but I do take Asla's point that, you know, in Europe, there is, you know, it's not in Europe's interest either to have these constant, constant battles with Erdogan and with Turkey. Um, so, you know, I think there have been some kind of positive signs on both Cyprus and on uh, the Eastern Med in recent weeks. We've seen the Greece-Turkey uh, dialogue restarting last month. Um, Cyprus talks are due to restart again this month as well. Um, just one final point that I would also make. I, I think that, you know, governments in Europe, the European Union and the US also need to start thinking really, really carefully about how they are going to engage with the Turkish opposition. Um, you know, you Omer mentioned um, the kind of uh, opposition reaction to this um, op-ed uh, from Biden saying, you know, calling um, uh, Erdogan an autocrat. And I think, you know, what the US has to realize is that Again, anti-Americanism is one of those things that is pretty you know, cross-social in, in the US and, um, you know, trying to sort of you know, publicly throw your weight behind the opposition isn't going to win you any friends. On the other hand, there is going to be a Turkey after Erdogan at some point. Um, you know, some people in Turkey are more optimistic and think that, you know, the 2023 elections are going to be the point where Erdogan is democratically unseated. I'm not quite as optimistic about that, I have to say. Um, but, you know, either way, one way or the other, there is going to be a Turkey after Erdogan. And I think, you know, at the moment, I don't see many signs that, um, you know, countries in Europe, particularly the UK um, or, or the US, are really making um, concerted and intelligent attempts to build their ties and their relationships with groups other than other than Erdogan and the AKP. Thank you so much, Anna. That's probably quite a wise, if I was asked, that would be an advice that I would give with so many uncertain things unfolding. Um, anyway, um, so I think all of your comments have kind of answered the question asked by Sir David Logan, who was our ambassador in Ankara, but also Vice Admiral Patrick, who is the French um, defense attaché in London on the whether or not these actually demonstrate a sincere change in foreign policy or domestic politics or these are just basically a parenthesis within a long-term trajectory i.e this is done for economy some sort of easing but actually the long-term trajectory 
both because of Turkish foreign policy, but also strategic issues within Europe and with US remain the same. And I think your kind of presentations all brought that together. But there's one particular question, Omer, um, that's from our friend Suat Kanıklıoğlu, who's in Turkey, who's a former Turkish MP and politician and also analyst. Um, and that's about an example of basically compartmentalization, right? Um, he basically asked whether or not you think, or on uh, Asli and Hannah too, please do feel free to ask. We don't have much time on, on, on um, in terms of this webinar, but um, he thinks whether or not, it, do you think it would be possible for US and Turkey to come up some sort of a, um, a negotiation over S-400s, a bit like, hey, you keep S-400s and we'll deal with the YPG SDF kind of question in Syria. So Turkey will come to some sort of grand bargaining over um, a, a, a PKK related groups in Syria, as well as S-400s. Um, obviously that will have a lot of ramifications for Turkey NATO tensions that we see overall, but do you think that's possible? Um, I, has the water passed under the bridge? Um, is it too late now to come up with a deal in both terms? Well, a, a transactional relationship is always possible. Uh, it depends on what's at the table. Uh, the Kurdish issue, can you hear, hear me by the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, the, 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 the Syria YPG issue, I think is uh, somewhat easier to deal with for the United States now that the Islamic State ISIS is no longer uh, the big threat, the caliphate, the big threat that it was. Uh, the S-400 issue, so the tying it to uh, S-400 to, to YPG, I think there is room for uh, bargaining on, on the YPG and how the United States wants to approach this issue. On the S-400, the issue that makes it very difficult is this congressional uh, authorization of the National Defense uh, Budget, National Defense Authorization Act. The language there stipulates that the S-400s for the sanctions to be uh, taken out for, for sanctioned relief, they have to be uh, out of Turkish territory. So the, the language is clear. In other words, the kind of formula that the Turkish Minister of Defense, Sulusi uh, Akar, uh, uh, proposed, the so-called Crete formula, to put it basically somewhere where it will not be used, not to operationalize it, not to activate, act, activate it. I think the Americans uh, were, would, be, would have been very happy with that a year ago. Uh, that was part of the, uh, what they were proposing. In fact, they proposed that, that no, no activation with strong verification that it will be activate, activated. They were happy to sell the Patriots uh, with a better deal with some vague technology sharing and Turkey would be back in, on the F-35. Uh, deal. So that was the kind of package that Erdogan had from the Trump administration. And I think uh, this deal is no longer there. Uh, I think now there is a higher bar to pass because of the NDAA. Uh, so I'm afraid that uh, the whole uh, notion that there can be a uh, technical uh, working group that will look at uh, S-400s, whether they can be compatible with NATO, uh, equipment or can they, that can be compartmentalized. That to me seems like what, when I talk to people who are more technical, it's a non-starter for, for the US. And it's, it's been a non-starter. Uh, now, uh, if uh, things come to a very difficult situation where Turkey basically says, uh, after the Halkbank case, I mean, I'm waiting for Halkbank. Halkbank will be the big, the big issue in, this, in, the, in the next year. Uh, when the, when the uh, billions of dollars of penalty will come from Halkbank, if it does, but I, I think it will be very high. And I have the uh, 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 PNB Paribas uh, example in mind, which was uh, fined by $9 billion, billion for trading with uh, three countries under embargo. If there is such a huge uh, uh, financial penalty, I, I think Turkey will hope that somehow uh, uh, there can be some negotiation, especially with the treasury part. Uh, so I'm not 100% uh, sure about the technical details about whether the treasury will be able to control the sum of the fine, uh, but there will be some bargaining uh, in terms of uh, what the court will dictate and what the treasury uh, will probably come up with as well. On that front, maybe Turkey will decide that it may, it will uh, find a formula for the S-400s outside the Turkish territories. It may be temporary, but Turkey will have to really compromise a lot because I think the U.S. will come to the table 
with a stronger hand once the Hulk Punk uh, penalties are there. Uh, and uh, Turkey's hand right now, given the economy, given the relations with Europe, uh, uh, is weakening. So in this newly emerging, more transactional mode, I think the United States will make it clear to the United States that this is to, 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 to Turkey that this is an asymmetric relationship. That there, there is a superpower, and then there's a regional power, and that it's it, time has passed for Turkey to act as if it had the upper hand, uh, and as if it was the superpower in this relationship. Yeah, it is really difficult to see a change on that because it's not just a question of Turkey, Turkey, US. It's also Turkey, Russia relations that comes in, right? So there is an element of how far Turkey can also piss off Putin at the other end, vis-a-vis -vis what Turkey needs him for in energy, but the Syria question and overall Middle East and Libya question. Absolutely. I mean, if I were Erdogan, one issue that would keep me awake at night if I turn off the S-400 deal or give it to another country is how would Putin respond? Exactly. Uh, and Putin has more leverage. Uh, if the US has leverage with Turkey, with Hulk Bank, Putin has one big leverage, in my opinion, and it's called Idlib. Uh, if, he, if he does something big in Idlib, like bombing it or like uh, really turning Idlib into hell, that could mean uh, two, three more million refugees on Turkey's border. And that, that's a big stick that uh, Putin ha has. And I'm not even getting into other dirty files that Putin may have on, on Erdogan, including uh, 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 the last fi five years, what happened in Turkey in the last five years. Yeah, um, I, I, we don't have much time, but Asli and Hannah, I think one thing I really wanted to kind of come back to and, and, and because of both of your comments is the question of Cyprus, not just the energy resources. And Asli, you also made the point of basically the search for a new framework. And we've been discussing this for a few years now after the Cross Montana talks have failed. You know, 2004 was a major failure of Cyprus solution. And then the economic crisis in 2008, could have given us an incentive again to balance the question of peace dividend. Now it's not there. And then now at the moment, I don't really see any reason for peace except the North and Turkey's need. So the other side of the table doesn't really need necessarily a solution. But is there a way actually the UN, another UN solution could work? I mean, it seems like it's a dead end kind of tape playing again. Um, are we basically set for maybe rather than best friends forever, BFF by, by zone or kind of zone? Are we going to look for, if not two states, some sort of one and a half state, some sort of an international territory? Or do we just ignore it and look at actually populations? In other words, grassroots initiatives rather than all this kind of UN led secret talks never translating into public, actually work on peace building and then leave it a generation, see where it goes? I think, Zia, people would love doing that if they could avoid the Cyprus issue. It's a black hole as far as diplomacy is concerned. And I was lucky enough to have met early in when I started my career as a young journalist to have met Clarides and Dengtash in the late 90s. And, uh, you know, they enshrined, they, 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 ha they embodied the spirit of Cyprus negotiations between Turkish and Greek sides, which is uh, essentially a zero sum game. I would do anything for you not to get uh, what you want, uh, kind of a spirit. And then of course we've had good times on on plan and you know, uh, again in Cross Montana for a bi-zonal, bi-communal federation with real power sharing, but it hasn't been achieved because I think that uh, solution is the sec at this point. I mean, I, it's clear that uh, both on our plan and cross Montana, the Greek side, uh, which is the Republic of Cyprus, an EU member state, that had created an asymmetry in the relationship, and they were not comfortable with uh, the kind of power sharing arrangement that the uh, bizonal bicommunal federation this called for. Uh, with a minority that's by, backed by a large power uh, uh, with guarantor, guarantee rights. There's no reason to think the same thing if we were to pour over details and negotiate that again for months and months or years. There's no reason to think that it would work a third time. Uh, some interesting notions have been thrown about, like uh, Tur Turkish side demands, demands political equality, and it's clear that they feel there's no deal if there is no political equality. Even though Erdogan says, uh, has, uh, has talked about a two-state solution, and I think it was a huge tactical mistake for Erdogan to be the one to introduce that notion. 
I do think that uh, Turkey would be willing to compromise on some sort of a loose federation. Of course, a federation can be, there's a wide gamut there's a wide, it is a broad, uh, you know, sort of variety in terms of what a federation is. Uh, ideas have been thrown about sovereign communities getting together because Turkey wants two sovereign states, but maybe sovereign, not, not states, but sovereign communities or uh, other formulas whereby you could have not the type of tight, you know, tight federation, but maybe a looser form and uh, definitely would share one international representation and one citizenship, but then uh, uh, different governance structures. The reality is there are two, uh, you know, one and a half sovereign entities. There, or there's, they've, they've been, a, but the Turkish side has been exercising sovereignty too. It, it is a quasi state, but it has been uh, there for the past fifty years, and it's very difficult to reimagine. We need to reimagine this whole equation. I feel uh, strongly about that. This cannot be two states because I think that's a no go for many for the international community. But a federation can be far looser than we think. But ultimately, what I wanted to say was, look, um, Europeans wanted not to wanted to skirt around the Cyprus issue in dealing with East Med. If they could, they would. But it comes back to it. you just cannot avoid it because hydrocarbons and maritime disputes and this that and you know and also the sort of the. Uh, alliances in the region, you know, the sort of the anti-Turkey front, the front, uh, the, the new set of alliances, they're all related to the Cyprus issue. So there's, there's basically two options. We either we come up with a new framework or some sort of a new language and get back to settlement negotiations, convince the two sides to get back to settlement negotiations, or we tell Cypriot uh, communities and you know and and uh, and and citizens of this island that they need to go for and um, for an energy sharing deal. They can they may not be able to reach a solution, uh, but then they have to divide up the energy resources. It's it's very uncomfortable. But there, Cyprus is all about. Well, don't get me started talking about Cyprus. But Cyprus is all about uncomfortable facts that we've been ignoring. Uh, uh, on both sides. Yeah, I do feel so, your yeah, decade long black hole frustration with nothing comes out of it at the other end because I've been pulled into it. But I think Asta, which you already hinted, the entry of other regional actors because of the anti-Turkish dynamic of it, which is Egypt and you know UAE and Israel um, and, and Greece and all these kind of new defense agreements, new trade agreements, new energy agreements. I think that actually made Cyprus issue a lot more difficult than it was three years ago. So if we thought it was difficult in Cross Montana, so welcome to the next series of talks on it. Um, before we, we have only five minutes left. So I want to bring in Hannah, if you have any um, thoughts on this Hannah as well too, and then we can just conclude um, and thank our attendees. Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm quite cynical. <laughs> but, yeah, hopes for real progress in Cyprus as well. I mean, maybe it's um, maybe this is what happens when you're a journalist in Turkey for too long. You just get cynical about everything. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, something has to happen. You know, the fact is, you know, this this situation is only punished North Cypriot. So they're in this really, really unenviable position. Right. Um, so something has to happen. It can't go on as it is. Um, I think the only way really to kind of build any kind of settlement is from the bottom up. Like if you start approaching it from, from the top down, you just immediately get kind of bogged down in these divisions. And like you say, it's it got more complex since 2017, that's for sure. Um, the other thing that's made it more complex, I think, is, is the election of Ersin Tata um, as president. I mean, he's very, very clearly Ankara's man. That's no secret i think i mean he was you know pretty much visiting ankara every month in the run up to those elections um one thing i mean maybe i'm being too cynical when i say this but one thing that you know does concern me and concern some of the people that i speak to in cyprus who you know do tend to be sort of more um anti erdogan uh, anti tatar um turkish cypriots they are concerned that 
you know, if Erdogan feels like he's losing domestic support um, in the run-up to the 2023 elections, then he might try and use Cyprus um, as a kind of, you know, vote winner there, either by, you know, trying to stir up more tensions over Cyprus, you know, trying to use it, um, you know, to kind of bash EU powers with, or even by trying to kind of bring Cyprus into a, a sort of closer union with Turkey, um, something short of full annexation, but, you know, certainly, you know, extending Ankara's power over northern Cyprus. So I think those are the concerns. And I think for that reason, it is in Europe's interest to try and, um, you know, move, move towards some kind of settlement, even if they don't achieve a settlement. So at least, um, you know, achieve some serious steps towards a settlement fairly quickly to prevent that happening. Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about the zero sum kind of stuckness of the Cypriot conversation, forget about European conversations on Cyprus, which has kicked the can down the road, hoping it will disappear. Some of them actually didn't want it to disappear. It's always been a strategic move to keep the issue as it is because it's forever basically cements the issues that they didn't want to advance. But um, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for attending. Um, this webinar and 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 thanks to our um, panelists from Istanbul and from Washington DC. Uh, we made Omar wake up really early and he's been perseveringly hard. But I think as you'll appreciate, the topics that we discussed and it could have gone for a few more hours shows the complexity of having a Turkey policy, whether for London, whether for DC, whether for Brussels or any other European capitals, because it sits at the intersection of so many regional and global issues and developments whether it is question of Syria, counterterrorism, narcotics, arms control, all the way to mega important geopolitical issues from Russia, both in the Black Sea, which we didn't even have time to discuss in this call, or the East Med and the questions of Med. Um, and we need to have a, more conversations on Turkey. We need to have a more nuanced understanding of Turkey beyond Ottomans and only Erdogan as the main analytic framework, even though he does pull the weight on when it comes to foreign policy decisions. And hopefully um, you'll uh, follow us more at RUSI. And as we produce more of these webinars and papers and, and future projects on Turkey related matters, and particularly what it means for Britain and British defense and security and foreign policies from now on. And thanks to everyone who attended. And again, thanks to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.